The Yaya Towers West Wing, a prime piece of real estate, stands abandoned for over 30 years, a ghostly monument to the legacy of its owner, the late Nicholas Biwot. Known to many as the Total Man, Biwot was a powerful figure in Kenya's political scene, but behind closed doors, in hushed whispers, he was also known as the Bull of Auckland, a nickname bestowed upon him by Gigi Kariuki in Parliament back in the 90s. The story behind this peculiar nickname takes us to Auckland, New Zealand, and an embarrassing diplomatic hitch that occurred during a Commonwealth Heads of State Summit. Biwot, as part of then-President Moy's delegation, found himself in an unexpected situation. A female housekeeper, believing his hotel room to be empty, walked in on Biwot in a state of undress. The incident escalated quickly with the housekeeper accusing Biwot of attempted rape. Although the matter was quickly hushed up to prevent a diplomatic row, it became a source of amusement among Biwot's peers. But beyond the jokes and the whispers, Biwot was a formidable force. He was a shrewd and ruthless operator who wasn't afraid to flex his political muscle, and it was this ruthlessness that led him to construct the Yaya Center and the adjacent Yaya Towers West Wing, the latter now standing as a ghostly testament to his legacy. Despite its prime location, the West Wing has been abandoned for over three decades, its empty rooms and silent corridors echoing with stories of the man who built it. With a reputation that was as intimidating as it was influential, Biwot wielded his power with an iron fist. His political standing allowed him to navigate the treacherous waters of Kenya's political landscape with relative ease, but it was his ruthless determination, his unwavering ambition, that truly set him apart. The total man, as he was known, was a shrewd yet ruthless operator who built Yaya Center and the ghostly building adjacent to it. Trade Bank, a financial institution that went under by design, plays a pivotal role in the story of Yaya Towers. This bank, founded by brothers Al-Nur Kassam and Iqbal Kassam, was not just an ordinary financial institution, but rather a pawn in a larger, more complex game. Let's delve into the bank's beginnings. The Kassam brothers, ambitious and driven, embarked on the venture of establishing Trade Bank, but their efforts were not solely their own. The late Nicholas Biwot, known as the Total Man, and his Israeli friend Gad Zivi owned 75% of the bank. Biwot and Zivi used their influence within the bank to their advantage, engaging in underhand deals and advancing loans to themselves. Now, here's where the plot thickens. Trade Bank borrowed money from the Deposit Protection Fund. This money was meant for the construction of the bank's own building, the Trade Bank building. However, the funds were instead used to secure a loan against the assets of Yaya Towers Limited. Why, you ask? Back in the early 90s, the bank had advanced a hefty loan of 900 million Kenyan shillings to buy what? A loan that buy what never repaid. As time went by, Al Noor Kassam began to demand repayment for this loan. However, these demands were met with hostility. Biwot, known for his ruthlessness, unleashed the state machinery on Kassam. The situation grew so tense that, fearing for his life, Kassam fled the country. The scandal of Trade Bank serves as a stark reminder of the ruthless tactics employed by some in the world of business and politics. It exposes the dark underbelly of financial institutions and the length some individuals will go to protect their interests. In the end, the bank's fraudulent activities led to its downfall. The Kassam brothers, who had once dreamed of building a successful financial institution, were left with nothing but a tarnished reputation and a legacy of controversy. Fearing for his life, Kassam fled to Canada and has never set foot in Kenya since. The business partnership between Biwat and his Israeli friend Gad Zivi soon turned sour. The two had been thick as thieves, founding the HZ Group and the Trade Bank together. But as it often happens in tales of power and ambition, the unity didn't last. Zivi accused Biwot of sidelining him, of keeping him at the periphery of their shared ventures. This was a slight Zivi wouldn't stand for. To protect his interests, Zivi enlisted a second partner, a man by the name of Weizmann Aharoni. But Zivi didn't stop there. He brought in his best friend, David Kimchi, to bolster his position. Kimchi was no ordinary friend. He was a member of Mossad, Israel's intelligence service. Aharoni, too, held ties to Mossad. They were not just business associates. Zivi thought this show of force would intimidate Biwot. He was mistaken. Biwot was not a man easily cowed. The total man, as he was known, had a reputation for being a shrewd and ruthless operator. He didn't trust the spies Zivi had brought into their partnership. He saw them for what they were. A threat, a challenge to his power. 
and Biwot was not one to back down from a challenge. So he took action. Biwot beefed up his own personal security, he fortified his defenses, readying himself for whatever may come. He was prepared to protect what was his, to guard his interests with the same tenacity he had always shown. In the end, the fallout between Biwot and Zivi was more than just a business disagreement. It was a power struggle, a clash of wills between two formidable men. It was a testament to the ruthlessness of ambition, the lengths people will go to protect what they believe is rightfully theirs. Biwot didn't trust the spies either, therefore he beefed up his own personal security. And so, the stage was set for a battle of wills, a conflict that would leave lasting marks on all involved. Biwot's influence extended far beyond the business world. He had the ear of the president, which gave him almost absolute power. Nicholas Biwot, the man known in certain circles as the Bull of Auckland, was not just a shrewd business operator, but a formidable political force as well. His influence, fueled by his proximity to the president, extended to the highest echelons of power. One such display of his political might was his retaliation against a certain former U.S. ambassador to Kenya, Smith Hempstone. Hempstone had the audacity to support the clamor for multi-party sim and condemn Moy's government. This didn't sit well with Biwot, who, wielding his immense influence, had Hempstone expelled. But Biwot's retaliation didn't end there. He pursued Hempstone relentlessly even after the ambassador had returned to the United States. Biwat's reach was such that he could not be easily dismissed or avoided. He employed litigation from all corners, even going so far as to use Hempstone's ex-girlfriends to torment him. His relentless pursuit took a toll on Hempstone. The former ambassador, once a respected diplomat, found himself besieged by a storm of litigation and public scandal. The strain of the ordeal led him to quit his job as a diplomat, and he eventually filed for bankruptcy. Hempstone returned to his former career in journalism and spent his time authoring memoirs. He would later die of diabetes in 2006, five years after Biwot successfully sued him for defamation. This is just one example of how Biwot wielded his power of the extent of his influence. His reach was such that he could relentlessly pursue his foes, even beyond Kenya's borders. His power was not just in his wealth, but in his ability to use the political machinery to his advantage. Biwat's power was such that he could relentlessly pursue his foes even beyond Kenya's borders until they succumbed. The story of Nicholas Biwat, the Bull of Auckland, is a stark reminder of the power of influence in the hands of a shrewd operator.